Hello, I'm Chad Boyd, rangeland scientist at the Eastern Oregon Agricultural Research Center. One of the most contentious issues surrounding livestock grazing in riparian areas is end of season stubble height requirements. We often hear that a particular minimum stubble height is needed to trap sediment during high flow and encourage bank building, thus helping the stream channel to develop over time. However, field research on the influence of stubble height on sediment deposition has produced unclear results. Does this mean that stubble height regulations don't matter? Well, no. Stubble height does provide a useful index of grazing impact on the riparian area. Additionally, it may relate to other variables such as bank damage from trampling and plant vigor. Most importantly, it keeps managers looking at the resource. Tune in again tomorrow at the same time when we'll discuss how grazing management affects attainment of end of season stubble height standards in riparian areas. Riparian stubble height is often assessed at the end of the growing season. When cattle are moved from riparian pastures in June or July, this can leave managers scratching their heads over just how closely the vegetation can be cropped at mid-season and still expect adequate regrowth to meet end-of-season stubble height requirements, most of which range from four to six inches. To help answer this question, we designed a three-year study in which we clipped streamside plots to two, four, or six inches in either late June or late July. We then measured end-of-season regrowth in October. With June clipping, all clip stubble heights met a four to six inch end of season requirement. However, regrowth dropped off sharply with July clipping and it became difficult to meet a six inch end of season requirement. Bottom line, an early pull off date may increase your chances of meeting end of season stubble height requirements. Woody plants such as willows benefit riparian ecosystems by improving channel stability and providing habitat for numerous wildlife species. Additionally, it is often assumed that shade from these plants will help to moderate summer water temperature extremes. However, in eastern Oregon, <laughs> research has produced mixed results. One often overlooked factor is position in the watershed. As water moves downstream from the headwaters, it is generally warmed by the sun, the same source that causes the air temperature to increase. If it flows far enough, water temperature will eventually reach a point where it is in balance with the air and soil temperatures. This is called thermal equilibrium. As stream temperature approaches thermal equilibrium, shade is less effective at moderating water temperature. The practical upshot of all this is that shade may have less influence on stream temperature as distance from the headwaters increases. 8409165. If you're like me, you have trouble enough keeping track of your keys, much less how the condition of your riparian pastures has changed over the last five or 10 years. Photo monitoring can help refresh your memory and help you to make better grazing management decisions. You'll need a camera, a reference board, some 5 8 inch rebar with end caps. A fixed power lens of about 50 millimeters is usually better than a zoom because you don't have to remember the zoom setting between years. For a reference board, paint a 3 foot, 1 by 4 inch board, black and white, alternating colors every foot. Monitoring sites can be problem areas such as an eroding bank or key areas that represent a pasture. Locate a site for the reference board in the center of the photograph and mark it and the camera location with rebar. Aim and focus the camera at the top of the reference board. Now for the test. How many of you can remember the numbers I rattled off at the beginning of this program? If you can't, you may be a candidate for photo monitoring. Sage grouse management is, is controversial in part because there is much we don't know about the biology of the bird and its habitat needs. Here are some things that we do know. At higher elevations, declining fire frequencies have caused a tenfold expansion of juniper communities since settlement, while annual grass communities are expanding rapidly at lower elevations. As of the late 1990s, the invasive annual cheatgrass covered over 17 million acres in the Great Basin alone. Juniper and annual grass communities don't provide much in the way of sage-grouse habitat. Additionally, roughly 11 million acres of sagebrush habitat have been lost to towns, power lines, and rangeland conversion. My point in all of this is that there are many factors affecting sage grouse. This often flies in the face of interest groups that would like to make this a one-issue problem. If we don't address the issue as a multi-level problem, the grouse may be the ultimate loser. I'm Chad Boyd, and thanks for listening.